We've got a triple header of action, spring football style on the Big Ten Network Saturday as Ohio State will kick things off. That's going to be at noon Eastern on the Big Ten Network. Of course, their quarterback battle is going to be a huge part of the storyline for the Buckeyes. Then you'll see the Penn State Nittany Lions at 2 Eastern. Their quarterback battle is being called such. Everyone doesn't quite know if that's convincing, but we will see what Drew Aller brings to the table at QB for Penn State. And then the Michigan State Spartans take the field. You'll be able to see that at 4 Eastern Saturday on the Big Ten Network. And for more on that lineup of Big Ten games we've got coming up this weekend, let's go ahead and talk to my guy Josh Pate. He is of 24-7 Sports and CBS Sports HQ. Josh, really appreciate you taking the time to be with me here. And the, let's start with the team that kicks off the Big Ten Network's coverage, our triple header on Saturday, Ohio State. The, the quarterback position for the Buckeyes is obvious, obviously a huge storyline, but team-wide, the way the season finished for Ohio State last year after another Michigan lost, but then an impressive performance in the semifinals against Georgia where they don't come out with a win. I'm curious for your thoughts just kind of on the state of the Ohio State program. The state of it's very good. It would, it would be surprising if you did a quick scan of message boards and whatnot or you just trusted Twitter for your go-to on all things Ohio State football because people would lead you to believe it's, it's time to panic and not that they're coming off a 6-6 six and six season, but as all of us watching this know, there are basically three boxes they want to check up there. You got the Michigan game, Big Ten championship, and at least compete for a national championship. And this is one of those very, very few programs where you can realistically be in double-digit win territory. And yet, if you don't check those final boxes at the end, people start talking about things like hot seat, which is just insane for 99.9% .9 of the rest of the free world. But that's where Ryan Day is. Here's the good news. He gets to sell that urgency. He gets to sell that us backed up against a cliff and the entire world in our face to a roster that is supremely talented, to a roster full of coaches that are supremely hungry because they haven't gotten it done. He, as a head coach, is beginning to be questioned because all of a sudden, you know, with that, with that close loss, margins of inches in that Georgia playoff game separate people from calling him a national championship winning coach, which he would have been, versus people calling him the guy that inherited what Urban left and now can't get over the hump himself. It's crazy that it works that way. And now we get to watch that quarterback competition play out. And Kyle McCord's got a great opportunity because Devin Brown with the finger issue won't be really active in the spring game. I don't know what you can win in a spring game, but I do know next to fall Saturdays, you don't get on a bigger public stage. There's no bigger spectacle than the spring game. And we've seen some guys that just tend to crank it up a notch when the lights are brightest. I don't know that that's Kyle McCord. I don't know that that coaching staff knows that or not. There's only one way to tell, and we'll find that out in the shoe Saturday. Let's stick with the, the quarterback position for a moment here, because when you look at the, the adjustment, I suppose, that has taken place with Ryan Day since he's been the Ohio State head coach, is that the passing attack, the quarterback position, the wide receiver position led by Brian Hartline, it seems like they're in a really elite category there. I mean, how rarefied is the air that Ohio State operates in with their passing game, kind of regardless now of who the quarterback and receivers are? Well, think back over the last five years or so in college football. We had that 2019 LSU year. And that was a standalone as far as that program's concerned. Then we've had Alabama with a few years, and we've had Ohio State. Those are the three mainstays. Clemson, once upon a time, had that quarterback wide receiver room, elite synergy. They've fallen off a little bit. I think what strikes most people who observe the sport from 50,000 feet is the consistency. They've continued to pump them out at Ohio State. They've continued to have elite options in the quarterback room and several elite options in the wide receiver room, so much so that some other teams, all Americans, end up being transfers that once upon a time resided in Columbus, Ohio. And I think, therefore, when, when we in the world of 24-7 sports, for example, when we're looking at kids who commit to Ohio State, could be a five-star, could be a four-star, you just assume they're going to maximize their potential there or either they're going to transfer somewhere else because other four and five stars have crowded the room so much to where another good player couldn't get on the field. It's really a testament. It's elevated Brian Hartline. He's probably... I mean, I would argue one of the very highest profile assistant coach names in the country. He's got head coach in his future and now assumes offensive coordinator responsibilities there. So anyone, and I deal with this a lot in the DMs and emails, anyone who tries to tell me, oh, that team, they just can't do this. They can't do that. It's like Lincoln Riley at USC. Same thing. Can't do this. There's a difference in can't versus haven't. 
Ohio State and Ryan Day are just simply in the haven't camp yet and they get to take a shot at it every year that's not a team that has to has to fail and then build another three years to get another shot they're in it every year well let's move on to state college where you just recently were and you had a, a really extensive conversation with james franklin and you know, james franklin is a great interview regardless but i, I urge people to go to your youtube channel lick kick with josh pate and, and make sure they check that out man it was um, really fantastic work by yourself as well. But I'm wondering what was maybe the main takeaway you had from spending such extensive time with James Franklin? Well, everyone talks about NIL right now, and every program has dealt with it. Some have embraced it and thrived. Some have been dragged kicking and screaming into NIL. And the closer you get to Penn State, the more or the louder that drumbeat gets of understanding there's been some dissension. You know, there's there's a little bit of of tug of war going on between certain factions and entities that exist within any major program. And one of those has been NIL. And that's been, do we just fully go all in on football or, or do we divvy up resources and make sure all the other sports are taken care of? And listen, there are some hard truths to face. And in the real world, one of them is football drives the bus, whether people like it or not, and they generate revenue for the other sports. And when James Franklin sat down with us, I have never had a head coach be as open and just brutally honest on the record as he was. Off the record, they'll tell you this stuff all the time. But he goes on the record, and, and to their credit at Penn State, he did say, I feel like we're getting yeses on things for the first time in a long time. I feel like the energy is moving in the right direction. But he also said in the very next breath, other programs we're expected to compete against are two years ahead of us. In something that's only been around three years, they're two years ahead of us. And I'll tell you what else he also said. He said, my name, when it's been involved in conversations about other jobs in the past, has allowed me to essentially use that as a little bit of leverage to tell our folks, hey, if, if you do value me, if you value the culture we have here, if you value the staff we've built and the direction we're going, we need investment. And he didn't say these words, but he left it open to interpretation to mean, if you don't give it to me, I can go elsewhere and get it. <laughs> now, this, again... This is something that coaches are willing to say off the record. James Franklin was willing to say it on the record, which usually means one of two things. Either he's totally desperate, which I don't think is the case, or he's comfortable enough that things are moving in the right direction where he can be that open. And if that's the case, when you combine it with the kind of roster they're going to field this fall, I think it's reasonable to say Penn State has the best shot they've had in several years to compete for Big Ten compete for college football playoff and and knock some of those dominoes down that James Franklin hasn't been able to knock down. Yeah, I mean, that national championship conversation, when you're talking about having a five-star QB, five-star running backs, a defense that returns led by Manny Diaz, the expectation certainly high in State College. Uh, let's transition to East Lansing. I'm actually going to be there on Saturday for their spring football kickoff. I'm just wondering, when, when you think about if we can take the Michigan State discussion a little bit more macro as the Big Ten is a conference that hasn't yet announced what they're going to do with divisions. I'm curious for your thoughts on the right now the East Division, obviously one of the deepest in college football. Michigan State operates in there. Are they the type of program led by Mel Tucker that would potentially benefit from the Big Ten maybe doing away with divisions? Oh, huge. Yeah, absolutely they would. You know, my personal stance on playoff expansion has always been I don't really care for it. But in the same breath, I look at programs like Michigan State or Penn State, these, these programs that just so happen to be locked in via imaginary lines on a map to the same division that Ohio State and Michigan are in. And I say, yeah, I'd probably be a little bit more pro-expansion if I were in their shoes. And with Michigan State, especially if they redesign this conference and they redesign scheduling therein, and then you combine it with a world where we have an expanded playoff, it's this whole new world period. It's this whole new way of defining success. You finish number nine in the country in yesteryear and you missed out. And then some people would have the audacity to say you go to a meaningless bowl game. I'm not one of them, but some people would have that audacity. Well, then you fast forward a few years, and all of a sudden you're, you're a playoff coach. And the reality is you're no different. It's just we changed the parameters. With Mel Tucker and Michigan State, though, it, it's, it's not quite Texas A&M on a, on a national scene in terms of the, the broad, white, hot spotlight. But within the Big Ten, there is a bright white hot spotlight there's a reason for example you'll be there there's a reason we're talking about them it's because people want to know essentially was it two years ago is that what i'm supposed to remember is that what i'm supposed to think you are or is last year what i'm supposed to think you are and the troubling part is defensively that's supposed to be the hallmark of a mel tucker team uh, they were very porous last year and they can't run the ball and i would imagine 
people of Mel Tucker's ilk will look you in the eye and say, we got to be able to run the ball, play physical, and play smash-mouth defense. And when you can't do those things, then you start to ask, okay, well, what kind of identity is this program and this team taking on? So I'm not one to hit the panic button after one year. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is we don't play 162 games. This is not Major League Baseball. And so when, when you got 12 of them, and as was the case last year, you, you, you're losing several of them by more than one possession. It wasn't a, it wasn't a case where they're just they're like Nebraska. They're losing all the one possession games. They weren't one possession games. They weren't close in many cases last year. That is that is a team that I've had my eye on all spring. That's a spring game that I've made special note to circle with the green sharpie on the calendar. And I know the the folks in Ann Arbor have already had their spring game, and I, I saw that you were watching that one pretty closely with Jim Harbaugh and the Wolverines. Back-to-back Big Ten championships, despite coming off an offseason last year where a lot of news was made about maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't continue to be the Michigan football coach. Same thing has taken place this offseason, but there's a lot of talent that returns from the Wolverines. How do you see them? Are they the Big Ten favorites again? Yeah, they are. I don't know what the odds market says, but if I were to have my own little odds board back here, yeah, they are. And and frankly, if they're not, it hasn't mattered the last two years for them anyway. They'll, they'll win there. They'll win in your building. It doesn't matter. With Harbaugh, I don't think people fully appreciate how crazy this story is. Maybe in 20 years, if he's if he's gone and he's moved on and we're telling the story of the Harbaugh era, the fact that there were there were sizable chunks of the Michigan fan base, let alone the, the national college football public, that thought after the COVID year, they were dead in the water and they should probably just move on from him. The thought that after that, along with back-to-back years of NFL flirtation, that's when it went into overdrive for them. It makes no sense to the casual fan. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's a phenomenal story. And then also, you look and you say, oh, they must have had a top five recruiting class. No, they didn't. Now, they have leveraged the portal very advantageously, and that's the key word. When you watch their spring game and when you look at their roster, there is no desperation position. There's no desperation unit for them. They can be of offensive linemen out of the portal, and offensive line, that's what stood out to me the most when I watched their spring game because it, it seems like they're settling in to a rhythm now where it's going to be plug and play on the offensive line. They, they're they Joe Moore Award winners last year, and I think they're just going to be in that conversation every year. It's a culture thing. Talked to Manny Diaz, defensive coordinator at Penn State the other day, and I wanted to know, why are you so successful here? He said, well, it, it's not just me. It's, it's the fact that I came to a place that has a culture that is conducive to high level defense being played. Well, if you're if you're running things on the offensive line at Michigan, Jim Harbaugh has created a culture that is conducive to very high level offensive line play. That's going to make them a very attractive destination in the portal and therefore it doesn't really matter if they recruit in a top 5 level nationally. They'll be able to supplement via the portal and they have very few busts there. They are supreme developers of talent. Uh, Michigan is rolling right now. Uh, of course the logical national question will be well, okay, can you can you win a playoff game? Like it's just carryover. Like you you pick up with winning the Big Ten. Now we got to go try and win a playoff game. They got to start over every year. But I would agree with your question. They are the odds on favorite in my mind to win the Big Ten. So they'll be, I think, right back in that position. Wolverines fans, they will certainly be watching it closely, as will all of us. We'll be watching you closely as well, Josh. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you. She was a four-time first-team All-Big Ten player at Indiana, helping lead the Hoosiers to their best regular season in program history this past season. On Monday, Grace Berger became the highest-drafted WNBA player in Indiana women's basketball history, taken seventh overall by the Indiana Fever. She's the first first-round pick in IU women's hoops history. Quite a season, quite a career for Grace Berger. And I've said this, uh, I've tweeted this a couple of different times that if I wasn't a Hawkeye, you know, I, probably Caitlin Clark wouldn't even be my favorite player. It would be Grace Berger because of the versatility, because of everything she brings to the table as a competitor. Grace, uh, great to, to see you again. Really appreciate you joining us here today. I, I would imagine for you, you know, you're back home in Louisville, Kentucky right now, but you know, you've spent five seasons and pouring out blood, sweat, tears for the Hoosiers. This is, it, it feels like you get to stay home in your home state. How excited were you to actually be drafted by the Indiana Fever? I was thrilled. Um, I mean, I, I, I was just, you know, filled with all kinds of emotion, um, excitement, and, and, and just feel really fortunate. Um, I was really sad 
um, about a week ago when I started moving my stuff out of out of Iowa much to me for the past five years so um, to be able to go back um, obvious obvious as a professional uh, I mean it's it's everything I could have possibly dreamed of now, I would imagine it's been quite a roller coaster over the last few weeks between the, the season ending in the way that it did and then literally three weeks to the day later you're drafted number seven overall by the fever what have the last few weeks been like has there been much time to, to just kind of decompress uh, I mean, I think, you know, honestly, the, w the way we lost, I think it was kind of good for me to be able to move on quickly and start, you know, focusing on on the next chapter of my life. Um, so, I, I mean, I haven't had, you know, a whole lot of time, obviously, to reflect on, on my time in Indiana. I know I'm super grateful for everything we did, not only this season, but, you know, in my five years at IU. Um, the, the last few weeks have, have been a whirlwind, like you said, um, just getting ready for the draft, talking to different teams, um, obviously still working out up at IU with my coaches that they, they were doing, you know, a great job of getting me ready, feeling, uh, getting me feeling really prepared for, for the next step. Um, so it's been busy, but um, I love the game. I love playing the game, so I wouldn't have it any other way. And it's one thing for those of us who, who cover the sport, who enjoy the women's game, to see the, the way that interest in it has continued to grow. What's it been like for you, though, as a, a key figure in the historic rise of Indiana women's basketball, but then also being one of the people who everyone tunes in for as you know, viewership increases and these historic record crowds that you guys had at Assembly Hall have been going on? It's been amazing. Um, I think out of, you know, everything you know all the wins all the accomplishments that me and my teammates and my coaches were able to accomplish at iu the um greatest one the thing that i think i'll hold on to for the longest um is definitely just the fan support that that we've seen uh, kind of accumulate at iu um you know i say it all the time back in 2018 my freshman year there were maybe you know 2,000, 3,000 people in there consistently and now um fast forward to this past season and we were filling up um, assembly hall not just one game not just two games but pretty much every single game so um i mean just to just to see the excitement grow about women's basketball i'm obviously a you know huge women's basketball fan i have been since i was younger so to be a part of the the growth of the game to be able to be in the situation that i'm in um in such an exciting time for uh, women's basketball but female sports in general um, it's it's unbelievable and something that is extremely special to me. Well, take me back to that, that December game when you guys faced Auburn. And, you know, you, it was big news when you decided you were going to come back for another season, see if you can continue to push new boundaries with Indiana. And then fairly early in the season, you end up getting injured. You're, you're on the court clutching your right knee. I, I would imagine it, it had to be a pretty gripping moment for you, literally and figuratively. W were you in fear that maybe your season wouldn't even be able to continue? Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, when you decide to come back for that fifth year, um, I had a lot of, you know, I think great reasons to, um, you know, just kind of, you know, getting better at my my game, fine tuning some details, um, being able to be, you know, a leader and, and play that point guard position, I think, were things that were all, you know, really good for me and went into that decision. But on the flip side of that, um, you have the risk of, of getting injury, uh, getting injured and, um, you know, potentially ruin what, what my ultimate dream was of, of playing in the WNBA. So, um, you know, when I got hurt, it was, you know, a, a nightmare come true, um, I would say. And I obviously, you know, in the moment, uh, thought the worst, uh, feared, you know, that, that it would be a season in ending injury, but also, you know, potentially ruin my career far after, after IU. So, um, you know, once I got the news that I would be back, I think I just had a whole new perspective, a whole new um, appreciation for the game. Every time I step on the court, um, I want to give it give it my all because, you know, it's truly a blessing to have all the, you know, physical capability to be able to play this game day in and day out. So, um, you know, at the time, it, it was obviously something that was really hard for me, tough for me. But looking back on it, um, I think, you know, I could find uh, the positives in it for sure. And I think ultimately it was something that was was good for me and, and will be good for me for years to come. And so many positives, obviously, you know, highlighted your your five years in Bloomington and any of us who've been recruited to an institution before we get there and we have all these expectations of making history. And we talk about it with the other folks in our recruiting class. You actually did it, Grace. You, you showed up here and you were able to help 
uplift Indiana women's basketball to historic heights. You know, the, the attendance, the viewership numbers, your, your personal accolades, an Elite Eight run. How confident were you? You committed to Indiana before your junior year. Has this played out as well as you anticipated or even better? Um, I mean, looking back on it, I, I wish we would have won a couple more championships for sure. But, um, you know, also, like, we, we've been able to do so many things that um, have never been done at Indiana before and are kind of unheard of um, for IU women's basketball. So to be, you know, a part of that that change uh, that I think will last for years to come, I think IU, you know, belongs being a top 10, top five program year in and year out. And I think they will be. Um, far past my career, my five years at Indiana. Um, but, you know, you just have to give all the credit to Coach Moore. And I think when she came into to my house and, and recruited me um, when I was probably 15, 16 years old, she was just someone that, that you realized was, was super special. And um, it wasn't hard to believe in her just seeing um, how passionate she was about, about turning Indiana around, how hard she worked, um, how she comes into the office every single day and brings her best for herself and, and those around her um you know it, it wasn't difficult to believe uh that she would accomplish all that she's done so um, i have to give all the credit to her i was just you know using her as a role model and following her lead and uh, a lot of great things were able to happen from that and your dad todd has been such a huge part of your basketball journey over the years i, I would imagine that at this point I mean, has, is he willing to admit that all those late nights where you're waking him up out of bed to get into the driveway and shoot hoops having him rebound for you is he willing to admit that's been worth it by now oh i mean i think so i think in the <laughs> moment he probably didn't love going out there in the, in the snow um with gloves on rebounding for me um you know late at night but um, he was always willing to do it. I mean, he loves the game just as much as I do. And um, he really, I think, kind of bought into my dream early on, saw that it was something I really cared about. And so, um, like I said, this is just as much of an accomplishment for myself as it, as it is for him. So um, it's just been a, a really special, I think, experience for the both of us. Uh, no, I'm not alone in saying that so many of us cannot wait to watch you with the Indiana Fever in the WNBA. Grace, congratulations on your journey so far and best of luck moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Michigan State takes the field for its Spartan football kickoff this Saturday, which you can see here on Big Ten Network at 4 p.m. 27 players took the field for Michigan State on defense last season, the most in the conference. MSU returns 80% of its production on offense and the Spartans are slated to have the second most difficult schedule in 2023. Time now for our big interview and we are joined of course by Michigan State head football coach Mel Tucker and coach Tucker I'm going to be making my way to East Lansing a little bit later today uh -huh. looking forward to calling your spring football kickoff here for the Big Ten Network and as you get ready to take the field I know there's going to be a lot of folks who are very curious just what what format will the practice end up taking on injuries are always a consideration when you end up making these decisions so what will Spartan fans see when they come out to Spartan Stadium yeah they'll see more of a practice type format for us uh in the beginning, you know, some individual work uh, with the position coaches, then we'll get some some group work in, some group crossover work. And then at some point in the second half of the practice, uh, we'll get some live 11-on-11 11 11 scrimmaging going on. So I think the fans will enjoy uh, what we have in store. They'll get a chance to see the guys working individually by position and also see them competing good on good in a live scrimmage format. I know I've checked the weather. The weather is supposed to be spectacular <laughs> in East Lansing Saturday as well. So that'll be something fun for the folks to go out and, and check out. And so you didn't end up having those additional bowl practices. It can be huge for just development of a roster. Yeah. But you obviously had winter conditioning and players have been able to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. What did you sort of impart to your guys as maybe the main focus you wanted them to be able to improve upon leading in the spring ball? Yeah, well, we had uh, the, over, the overarching concept is uh, a relentless mindset in everything we do on and off the field. And then our three core values of toughness, uh, discipline, and being unselfish. And so we've hammered those things the entire out of season conditioning program and throughout spring ball, and our players have responded very well. Well, you've always been one of the most aggressive coaches in the transfer portal, adding talent from all around the country. No different this off season. How would you assess the, the talent you've been able to add via the portal? 
Yeah, it's been uh, it was very targeted. Um, we have specific needs, things we wanted to get done uh, in recruiting through the high school ranks or through the portal. Um, and we were able to, to, to really have a really good mix of high school guys and portal guys. This is the best uh, portal class that we brought in since I've been here from top to bottom. And we were able to really uh, get uh, a lot uh, bigger in our defensive line. We were able to add a uh, key player on our offensive line. Uh, we were able to add uh, to our running back position, to add to the competition uh, there, and also to add some some uh, some some uh, some players to the, to our secondary. So um, I feel really good about what we've done there. Uh, we also did a really good job with the tight end position. We we always have a tight end on the field, and uh, we have a couple of players that we brought in from the portal. They can help us uh, there, um, and we still have a couple more guys that are, that are not here yet um, that will be here at the end of May and in June. And so um, I feel like our roster is going to be very strong. Um, we just have to stay healthy, get the horses to the race. And you're always preaching competition, you know, kind of on a daily basis, it feels like. Some folks may be surprised, though, to, to hear that having a multi-year starter returning at quarterback, that the quarterback job is being competed for as well. How would you describe why that is? Yeah, well, I, I think you have to prove yourself every day, you know, as a coach and a, or as a player. Uh, you know, there's nothing ever set in stone. It's always, you know, what have you done for me today? Um, and we have to prove it. And that's at the quarterback position or any other position. And I think competition, I believe competition is, is, is healthy. It's good for everyone. If you're a, real, if you're a true competitor, uh, competition should make you better. And it's important for us to make sure that we put the best players on the field, put the guys on the field to give us the best chance to be successful. And that's how you keep your locker room intact. That's how you keep... Uh, the morale high and everyone knows that they have a fair chance and so it's going to be like that uh here uh you know at the end of spring it's going to be like this uh, like that throughout the summer and all the way uh, through fall camp and also during the season you know it's always going to be fluid you know compete uh, put your best foot forward every day we're going to play the best players and fans have gotten to see a lot of Peyton Thorne, of course, over the last couple of seasons here. Not as much of Noah Kim and certainly not so much of Kaiten Hauser up to this point. How would you describe just what they bring to the table that give them an opportunity to try and challenge Peyton Thorne for the starting job? Yeah, well, Noah Kim, is, 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 uh, he's, got, he's been here for a few years. He's got some experience in the games. When he's gone in, into the games, he's done well. Um, he's a mobile quarterback. He's got a lot of arm talent. He's one of the top 15 fastest guys on our team. Um, and I think in high school, he only lost one game. So he's a fierce competitor. Um, he's got the experience now. He knows our offense. Uh, so he's, uh, he's competing at a very, very high level right now. Caden Hauser has a huge arm, a lot of upside. He's a young player. Um, the experience he got uh, last season, the reps that he got um, in practice with the varsity uh, was very, very important. And you can see that it's really paying off for him this spring. He looks a lot more comfortable in our offense. Uh, he has command. He has a lot of confidence, um, and his really his talent is really starting to show uh, through. Uh, he's doing a really good job uh, understanding our, our our checks in the in the passing game and in the run game, and uh, he's going to be a tremendous player for us. We believe. Mel, I'm sure you remember, probably not fondly, that you only had like what five healthy offensive linemen <laughs> last spring. You're moving walk on defensive linemen over to that side of the football just to get through practice. Health hasn't been a concern at that position group this spring. So how differently have you been able to, to, to practice, to function with all the offensive linemen you finally have available? Yeah, we started the spring with 19 offensive linemen available, including the walk-ons. And so we haven't had to modify our practices like we did a year ago. Uh, we're able to, to, to you know, get the normal amount of reps for, for our guys. We've got you know three groups plus. Um, and so we're able to work the guys at multiple positions like we need to do. Um, that's important for guys to be able to play multiple position, positions up front. Um, we have a really good competition at all of those positions. Um, we're able to you know, move guys uh, from the first team to the second team, even within a practice. And so you know, everyone knows they have to compete. Um, and so it's, uh, it's really going to help with our uh, cohesiveness in the offensive line and chemistry, which you have to have. Just the overall development of all of the players. You can't develop as a player if you're not available, if you can't practice. And so uh, what a difference a year makes. It's, uh, it's been a lot more fun for us uh, to go through spring ball with, uh, with the 19 guys healthy. 
Mel, I'm really eager to see what this next chapter of Keon Coleman's football journey is going to look like now that he's left hoops in his rearview mirror. What would you say his potential ceiling is as a player? I'll tell you what, uh, he's, uh, he's got tremendous upside. And um, there's a lot of things like about Keon. He's got a great personality. Um, he, loves, he loves football. He's a great teammate. He's emerging as a leader on this team. Obviously, we know that he's a super talented guy. He's 6'4" you know, a 215 pound plus guy that can run and jump and win the contested battles for the ball. Um, and I, I just think that his, uh, his ceiling is very high. He's a hard worker. He loves to compete. Um, he, wants to, he wants to be great. Um, he wants to have a great football team. He wants to win. And so he's willing to do the things that it takes to, to be successful. And so um, there's no telling how good he can be. Um, I'm glad he's on our team. Uh, defense, Jacoby Winmine played, felt like all over your front seven last season. Do you have a sense yet for maybe a more defined role he'll have in your defense going into this fall? Yeah, this season, you know, he'll be an off-the-ball backer for us um, primarily. Uh, we don't have any plans on lining him up as a defensive end on, on rundowns. Um, but obviously he has a tremendous pass rush ability. Uh, he showed that last season. So in obvious pass rush situations, um, you know, we do have the flexibility to put him uh, in those those uh, rush positions to get after the quarterback. But his his uh, his focus and his his position on first and second down will be an off the ball stack linebacker. It's going to be a lot of fun to see how you utilize him and so many other not only existing but new playmakers you've added to the squad. Looking forward to it, Coach. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you so much. Go Green. Brought to you by Gatorade. Take a look at Robin Fralick's career. Michigan State's got a brand new coach on the sidelines next season. Takes the reins in East Lansing. 192 and 76 in eight seasons as a collegiate coach. Made the postseason each of the last three years. 31 and 7 last season. 104 and 3. A couple of undefeated regular seasons as Ashland's head coach. And of course, the recipient of the C. Vivian Stringer Coaching Award. And for more on the Michigan State Spartans and their new basketball coach, let's talk directly to the new Spartans women's hoops leader herself, Robin Fralick. And coach, got to congratulate you. I'm sure it has to be an amazing opportunity. I was doing a little bit of research, of course, preparing for this interview. And as far as I can tell, I think you were like born in the Breslin Center, just looking yep. at where your hometown was by comparison to the arena. How cool is this opportunity for you to now come back home and lead the Spartans? Mm. Well, it feels surreal. You know, I, I graduated from Okemos High School, which is five, ten minute drive from here. I remember playing at halftime of the women's basketball games. I remember eating melting moments, ice cream sandwiches, and um, hearing the band play. And, and so it's, it, it feels surreal. It, it's just an amazing opportunity to be able to, to be back. Um, kind of where it all started. And you actually, I think, were involved in even some halftimes at Michigan State games back in the day. What, what exactly was involved in that? You know, it was the youth team. I think I was probably like a fourth or fifth grade team, and we got the opportunity to, to play at half, you know, and at that time, the court feels like the biggest court in the whole world. And, um, yeah, just an incredible opportunity when I was young and obviously grew up watching a lot of games, too, as a fan. How much did your phone blow up when the announcement was first made that you were taking the job? <laughs> Oh, I still have to return messages, and, and what's cool is there's people I haven't heard from for a long time, you know, that I went to high school with, or it almost felt like a high school reunion back again on my, on my cell phone, but um, grateful, you know, to have so many people um, be so supportive and, and uh, so appreciative and enthusiastic for, this, for me and my family. Uh, what did you think when you heard Alan Haller, the athletic director there, mention that he had Tom Izzo doing a little bit of investigative digging, you know, around coaching circles before they kind of made a, a pure decision on you? Yeah. Uh, I felt really certified. No, I just, it's a, you know, Coach Izzo's great. I've gotten a chance to get to know him a little bit. Obviously an icon, one of the best to ever do it. So to even get an opportunity to work in proximity with him uh, is going to be a great learning learning opportunity to watch watch the best and be around the best. Uh, when you were a youngster, you know, growing up watching Michigan State and, you know, you were yeah. still in your infancy of really your basketball journey while they were winning a national championship led by Tom Mizzo. Did it ever cross your mind back then that you might actually be a colleague with him working in East Lansing? 
never, never not once. I still feel like a fan when I see them. I still sometimes feel like I should ask them for if I can, you know, get a selfie with them. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's amazing how the the coaching world works. You know, I was a Division two coach for ten years. I was at Bowling Green State University the last five years, and you know, when I've been in coaching, I've never been in it to to chase anything. I've just been where I've been and tried to do the best job I could do right where I was. So um, for this to, to come full circle feels, I just feel grateful for it. But I also know what's really important is to be invested right where you are and do the best job you can with the people right where you are. So we're still in kind of the introductory phase for everyone around Big yep. Ten country to get to know you. How would you describe your coaching style for folks who haven't watched you work before? Mm. Coaching style, I, I'd say uh, focused, honest. I think it's really important to speak the truth in love, uh, make sure there's a lot of clarity around the way you play. You know, it, in regards to system, this past season at, at Bowling Green, we were second in the country in turnover margin. So uh, I've, I believe the teams I've coached have had a distinct personality. You know, I think it's been clear uh, about the, the way we play, how we play. And then the most important piece is playing like a team. The, the team piece has been just really critical and, and all the teams I've been fortunate to coach is that connected team piece. And the, the fact that you take over a program coming from the MAC, your predecessor, yep. Susie Merchant, was in the exact same situation and had so much mm -hmm. success, became one of the all-time greats. How do you view that, that step up in competition for you going from the MAC and now joining the Big Ten? Yeah. A uh, great challenge. I mean, the Big Ten right now for women's basketball is the best of the best, and not only in regards to players, coaches. I mean, we saw that in the NCAA tournament this year. And, you know, Coach Merchant was here 16 years and did an incredible job. Uh, her impact on the program, her impact in the community is, is still, it'll be felt forever. Uh, and, and she was able to make that transition, you know, and I know that this is going to be new and it's a new level and it's a, a new challenge. And, you know, we're up for figuring that out and, and doing our best in that. You've obviously got a, a pretty impeccable track record up to this point, and it led to multiple suitors wanting you to lead their program. And so you used the term investment earlier. Alan Haller, Michigan State, they've made a significant financial investment in you to get you to take this job. Do you view that as anything that adds additional pressure in this role? I think pressure is just part of this job. I don't know if there's additional pressure. I just know it's, it's, a, it's a piece of it. It's the, the highest level of competition. And, um, you know, it, you hear it a lot in coaching, but pressure is a privilege. When there's pressure, it means that something matters, and it, it makes you makes you want to do your best. It, it, you wake up every day thinking, all right, we've got this incredible opportunity. What are we doing today um, to make the most of it, and what are we doing today to maximize right where we are? So you won a national title in year two at Ashland. Yeah. You won the MAC in year three at Bowling Green State. So what's a realistic timeline before you start hanging banners at the President Center? I don't know. You know, I, even I've, I've never had a timeline. I just know that every day we're going to be about the same things and every day we stick true to who we are and how we play and how we operate under our culture and our core values. And, um, you know, one of my favorite things I had when I was the head coach at Bowling Green is I had a little hammer on my desk and it, the, st the stone cutter analogy that you just you keep doing the right thing, right? You just keep hammering every day and eventually one day and you don't know when that day will be, the, the rock breaks. And, you know, that's just been something that I've believed in. Um, and it's something I think that matters when you take over a program, just staying consistent with who you are and what you do and keep hammering away. And I, when I was an athlete in college, we went through a coaching change and we had players who yeah. transferred out. There wasn't even a transfer portal back then, of course. So yeah. Now it's no surprise that you've had some players that have hit the portal. And this is really even predating you. But once Suzy Merchant had to step aside for health reasons, some players have left the program. How do you see yourself going about roster construction moving towards next season? You know, we're in the middle of that right now. I think when you come in somewhere new, the, the people piece is the most important part. And obviously the game of college basketball has changed a lot in the last few years um, with the portal. And we know that's just that's part of the landscape of basketball. And, you know, we're, my staff will hopefully all be in here next week. And we know that's probably one of the most important parts right now is figuring out our team for next season. And you've been in this region for a while, just in the state of Ohio, as opposed to yep. in the state of Michigan, where you were born and raised. But that recruiting footprint, having experience nearby, do you see that as something that'll be a nice tool for you? Absolutely. There's so much good basketball in this region. 
You know, there's and you know, Michigan State is a national uh, brand, but it, there's a strong regional piece here, and there's really good high school girls basketball right all around us. And you know, having been in Ohio for a long time and having a really good familiarity and connections will will be important as as we get recruiting here at Michigan State. You mentioned the the relationship aspect of it. I'm sure you know well at this point, even observing from the outside in between. You know, like we referenced with Susie Merchant her health issues, and then days after she stepped aside, you had the tragedy on campus there. Mm -hmm. So you have players who are there who've been through a lot emotionally. Mm -hmm. How much focus will there be on, on just making sure that their, their mental health, in addition to their physical capabilities, will be something that you help build? Yeah, you know, that's something I think you have to be really mindful of when you're walking into this space. You know, obviously this wasn't a piece of what I was part of, but walking into it, you know, you know that that is something that, it's been a lot of challenges this year in particular for the kids with just situations out of their control. Um, so having a compassion around that and also having a, a momentum and a mindset of, all right, there's a resilience piece that is grown through that too. And I think that that part is really transformational as you continue to move forward. As, as hard as it is, there's a lot of pieces that um, help kids, you know, with resilience and, and working through things and sticking together. Um, that will be m momentum for us also moving forward. That's really well said, Robin. Um, the, the women's game has seemingly yeah. grown so much in recent years, and you've had so much success in your time in basketball as well. What have been your observations just about the way that the coverage, the consumption of the sport mm -hmm. has mushroomed recently? Well, it should be. It's incredibly high-level basketball. You know, so much of it is opportunities. Uh, every year, women are getting more and more opportunities younger, and we're seeing what that looks like. We're seeing the product of that. You know, I laugh. My mother-in-law always says that she only got to play one, one um, half of the basketball court. So she was a defender and rebounder. That we, you know, we don't even know how good of an offensive player she could have been. But obviously, that was a long time ago. And as has, as things have changed and evolved. Women have gotten more chances, and as we've gotten more chances, we've shown that we can do a great job with this. And the visibility, the coverage, um, all of that has, has been a big piece of it. But I also think it's been deserving of it. You know, once more people know how great of a product it is, and more the more coverage we have, um, that piece is is a back. Excuse me. That piece is a natural byproduct of that. So I'm excited. The women's game is exciting. The women's game has coverage, and I believe that it's just going to continue to evolve. If you can try to put yourself in this moment, what do you think it'll feel like the first time you're leading Michigan State women's basketball onto the court at the Breton Center? I think I'll have a five senses experience. Mm. Like I always think, you know, anytime when I'm coaching in a big game, I always try to really like feel my feet. You know, kind of like just feel my feet and make sure I'm present right where I am and, and enjoy that moment. Because so much in coaching is the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, worried about the next thing, you know, the next scout, recruiting, whatever it may be. But there's a real art to presence and there's a real art to taking it in and enjoying it. And, you know, that will be my goal is to kind of look around and listen to the, the band, you know, something I've been hearing since I've been a little kid in my backyard and um, think, wow, this is really cool and savoring that moment. Very cool. Robin Fralick, now the sixth coach in Michigan State women's basketball history. Congratulations again, Coach. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.